Test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the BC Ideas Exchange Economic Development Webinar Series. My name is Jessica Ritchie, and I'm part of the Regional Programs and Engagement Branch, which is part of the recently renamed Ministry of Jobs, Economic Development, and Competitiveness. I'll be providing technical support for today's webinar, as well as moderating the question and answer session at, at the end of our webinar, where, you, where you'll have an opportunity to ask all the questions that you have for our presenter. I'm located in Victoria, British Columbia, on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. First thing I'm going to do is go over a couple of housekeeping things, just in case that this is your first time on a go-to webinar session, and then I'm going to hand it over to today's speaker, Todd. Pew from Civic Info BC, who's going to share the exciting opportunities that are um, coming through with Civic Labs in terms of community apps that you may, able, may be able to tailor and leverage for your community. So um, just to, to give you guys an idea, you should have a control panel that popped up when GoToWebinar launched for you. Um, you'll see a number of uh, things and ways that you are able to interact. Uh, the biggest thing that you should know, if you have questions any time during the session, just pop those into the question pane. We'll be mo monitoring the questions throughout. We'll ask, jump in with questions for Todd if they're timely, or we'll be asking them at the end of the session um, that way. If you want to raise your hand, if you're having any technical difficulties, um, myself, uh, I can reach out to you that way, or you can just pop in a question into the question pane if you're having qu technical difficulties. Um, if you are calling in and having any challenges with audio, it may be a network issue, so uh, sometimes it is a little bit easier to connect with your phone, so you can just do that by um, clicking on the phone call option. A pin will pop up and you'll be able to connect with the, to the network that way. And then uh, last but not least, if you'd like a copy of today's presentation and slides, you should also see that in your control panel. You'll be able to download that um, today, uh, or you could download it from our website when we post the recording later next week. So that, that is a reminder that uh, you will be able to find today's recording on gov.bc.ca backslash economic development. It's under the BC Ideas Exchange section, and you'll see uh, the slides that have been prepared um, by Todd, as well as the uh, recording of today's session. And you can reach out if you have any questions or suggestions for future webinars from that website as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over uh, the present presentation to, to Todd, who's going to share with you the exciting work that's being done by Civic Labs to create some applications for communities across BC to be able to leverage. Great, thank you. Uh, I think I will start my screen share now. Give me one second. All right, I think we should be in good shape. So uh, thanks everybody for being here today. And uh, you know, I, I, boy, the webinar is kind of an interesting format. I'm used to doing a fair bit of uh, public speaking in front of crowds at uh, say uh, UBCM events or local government management association events. Uh, and I can usually get away with a cheap throwaway line about what a good looking crowd this is, but uh, I can't do that on a webinar. So uh, boy, that's, well, that's too bad. Uh, but thanks for joining us here anyway. Uh, glad to be here and thanks to the ministry for, uh, for making uh, this webinar happen and for inviting me to be part of it today. So I'm here today to talk about uh, our Civic Labs project, which is a uh, mobile app pool for local governments and First Nations. Uh, in terms of just some ground rules for the presentation, I, uh, I, I would like to invite you to interrupt me at any time if there are any questions that you have. Uh, we, we can pause the uh, formal presentation and go off on different tangents if you'd like. Uh, this, this can be relatively informal. We've got a, a good sized group here, but it's not so large that we can't, uh, we can't do that. Uh, as mentioned, we'll also have a lot of time at the end for uh, questions and answers, and uh, hopefully this is uh, something interesting to you, and uh, well, we'll get started. So uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Todd Pugh, and I'm the Executive Director of mm -hmm. Civic Info BC. We're a not-for-profit municipal information uh, data service. Uh, Civic Labs is a project of ours that we've been working on for a couple of years now. Uh, my email address appears on that slide. It's also at the end. I'm pretty easy to find if you Google me or just uh, look up Civic Info BC. Contact information will pop up all over your screen. Uh, we are also based in Victoria. Uh, we are also, uh, well, we're just up the road from, uh, from our colleagues down at the ministry. And uh, yeah, rainy day here, but uh, that's okay, normal for, uh, for this time of year in Victoria. 
So what we're going to be doing in terms of today's agenda, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem. We're going to define uh, what it is that uh, is the problem and what brought us to, to do this. I'm going to explain a little bit about the Civic Labs project itself, uh, exactly what it is and how it works, uh, the rationale behind it, the philosophy, the logic, all that good stuff. I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour of the first four apps that we've developed. Uh, or I, I should say three are developed, one is still in process, uh, one is still embedding, but uh, they're coming along nicely. I'm going to show you a little bit of the back end on how uh, people who are part of the Civic Labs project can manage their apps. Uh, very, uh, this is not a sales pitch, but I am going to give you information about how uh, it's priced and how people can be part of it, how they can order. And as mentioned, uh, there's going to be time for questions and answers too. So the problem, uh, how did we get here? Why do we need a Civic Labs app? pool project anyway. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting. This is a quote from uh, Stuart McLean. Some of you are uh, probably familiar with him. Uh, and, and this, I thought, really defines what we are as, uh, as a country, what we are even in British Columbia. And uh, it's just a quote from his book from 1984, Travels in Small Town Canada. Across thousands of miles, the Canadian population clusters loosely like loosely strung beads on the thread of the 49th parallel. This is truly Canada, a vast stretch of land and a bounty of small towns. It's small town. The Canadian experience is small town. In British Columbia, this is very true. We have 180 municipalities and regional districts in this province. That includes the Islands Trust. Um, we're about to lose Jumbo. It's about to go down to 179. We also have about 209 First Nation communities inside BC provincial boundaries. Now, to make my point about small communities, of all of those, so we're talking about nearly 400 communities, only about 20 have populations of over 50,000 people. 95% of local governments of First Nations are smaller. It's, uh, this is a province of small and rural communities. I think many of you are probably from small and rural communities. Uh, so this is, this is something we know well. Um, myself, I grew up in a town of, uh, of less than 1,000 people, or outside of a center that had about 40,000 people, but uh, that was the big city. Um, if, if any of you have ever seen Letterkenny, uh, that, that's where I'm from. Um, so yeah, this is a province of small towns, 20 with populations of over 50,000. And that's the 20 local governments that really have the resources to do um, things on their own. Means the reality of 2020 is this. Uh, you know, citizens and businesses have a reasonable and equal expectation uh, to have access to local government services, regardless of community size and location. And we all know mobile devices have transformed the way we've, uh, we, we access the internet, the way we access services, the way we access information. We almost all have one of those little monsters in our pocket. We are glued to them. The citizens are glued to them. Businesses use them. They, they're part of how we just live our lives now. So, you know, there's the tw there's, so those are the twin factors going on. Uh, we're glued to our smartphones and, and expectations for citizens and businesses are just at a level they've never been before. But because there are only those you know, a couple of dozen municipalities of that significant size, uh, most small communities neither have the resources nor the capacity to offer a range of digital services that uh, you might find in a larger urban community. So that, that's a real problem. That's the digital divide that we hear so much about. There's, uh, it, it's very real. Um, we hear about it all the time when we're talking to our uh, member municipalities, uh, you know, whether it's in the north, whether it's in the Kootenays, uh, northern Vancouver Island, wherever. It, it's, it's something that comes up all the time, and I'm sure you guys hear it too. And part of that uh, divide, is, it's, it's resource-based. Apps, anything software related, but you know, apps being what we're looking at today, they're expensive. And each time you build one, what people don't realize is you're actually building at least two. Um, you know, thank goodness Windows Phone has gone away because you were building three for a while, or BlackBerry, it's kind of gone away. Uh, but each time you build a, an app that's uh, purpose-built for a smartphone, you're building one for Android, and you're building one for iOS, for Apple devices. And they're very different. And uh, you, you can develop them in tandem, of course, but uh, the, you know, the code is different. The apps themselves are a little different. It's not just you know, build it once and away you go. So uh, that, that, that's certainly a barrier. So that's what we were dealing with. That's the problem that's out there. And uh, you know, we heard from small communities that uh, they would like to have um, access to, to some of these online tools uh, in a smartphone environment. So uh, we hatched the, the Civic Labs app pool concept. And um, 
how it works. It, it's um, well, this is this is um, this is what it is. Uh, it's a program run by us, Civic Info BC. Uh, the ministry formerly known as Jobs, Trade, and Technology. Thank you for the new ministry name. I was uh, I was stumbling on it. I will update the slides accordingly. But uh, you know how it works. Why are we doing this? Uh, we're what the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing calls a system organization, and system organizations perform functions collectively on behalf of local governments that uh, municipalities and regional districts couldn't do or uh, couldn't do as effectively on their own. So. You know, our core mandate, given that it's data and information services for local governments, we consider apps. Uh, it's a data service, it's an information service to be an extension of our mandate. So the model we hatched is something that we hope will save thousands of ta tax dollars across the province um, as uh, local governments adopt this and First Nations adopt this. And what it is, it's a simple and shared out-of-the-box mobile app solution available at an extremely low cost. So this is what's always been the case till now. You get three different local governments, in this case a hypothetical large village, a medium-sized town, and a small city. Each of them wants an app. They spend $15,000 each independently of one another to purchase an app that does more or less the same thing. Whether, whether they buy that from a vendor or whether they develop that uh, themselves uh, in, in, independently of one another, doesn't matter. In this hypothetical example, you've got three municipalities each spending $15,000, which equals $45,000 in tax dollars spent for essentially one app. So that's the problem when you're purchasing in silos. You can do better. Um, there's a good tradition. There's a lot of uh, history in, in places like Metro Vancouver, Greater Victoria, Vancouver Island, um, the north, uh, where shared purchasing is a reality. Uh, where you might get that same large village, medium town, and small city working together, and they share costs, and they spend $15,000 for that uh, single muni app, that municipal app, and they share it between themselves. So that's great. You know, when you do that kind of thing, you, you've saved collectively $30,000, um, and, and, and you still get the same benefit to your citizens and businesses. So that's a better model. Uh, it's a common one. We like it. We see that with all kinds of uh, you know, goods and services that, that's everywhere. But we thought for something like the apps, for mobile apps, there's an even better model. And that's pooled development. And this is what Civic Labs is. It's meant to be dozens and dozens of communities together in one single pool. And as a member of that pool, you pay a fixed monthly subscription. Average about 100 bucks a month. Um, a small community can be a little less, a larger community can be a little more, but it's, it's really meant to be about the price of a single cell phone bill of a larger variety. Um, and that's your subscription fee for your local government to belong to the Civic App Pool. For that single monthly price, you get access to every app that's in the Civic Labs library. Um, so at the moment, four apps, uh, more coming down the pipe. So instead of spending, say, you know, fifteen thousand each on an app, or spending, uh, you know, fifteen thousand uh, dollars among a few of you to do an app, you know, you would spend perhaps twelve hundred dollars a year for a fixed cost subscription, and you get now four apps, soon more. We think it's a pretty good deal when you start doing the math. When you start uh, crunching the numbers, it's something that um, you know it just drives the cost down to to the basement, and uh, we think that's pretty exciting in terms of bridging that digital divide. And the model's pretty simple. It's it's very circular. So starting down at the bottom le uh, bottom left, members pay a monthly subscription fee. When they pay that subscription fee and become a member of the pool, they get access to all the apps and they can brand them and deploy them from our Civic Labs app library. Members can also suggest new apps and vote for the next one in the development cycle. And our members uh, get new apps as we develop them too. Uh, new apps are developed with accumulated revenue from the subscription and then they're just added to the Civic, Civic Labs app library. So over time, the library grows. Pretty neat model. So lodging is very simple. A local government or a First Nation only has to subscribe, do some very basic configuration, and I'll show you how that works later. And when I say very, I mean, I mean very basic. Um, you don't have to have 
you don't have to have any computer skills really at all. If you can, uh, if you can uh, find your way around in a web browser, you can configure your apps, and then you just deploy. Uh, that's probably the trickiest part, is deploying the app in your community, because uh, not because it's difficult to launch the app itself, but uh, it's a marketing exercise. You have to make your citizens and your businesses aware that it's there and available for their use, and you have to commit to keeping it populated with your own information, with your own data. But really a simple concept. So I'll get into this, uh, our four initial apps. Um, the two that are fully ready now, we have one called Tell the Town, which is an issue reporter. We have another one called Town Crier, which is a public notice push notification. We have uh, one that's 90-ish percent done now, should be ready soon, called Tour the Town, uh, which is essentially a build your own purpose uh, driven map system. Uh, just very simple maps for community festivals, things like that. I'll get into detail. And uh, the fourth one, and this will be our most complicated one, uh, it is under development now. Working title is My Pet Pal. We're not sure we're gonna keep that name, um, but it's essentially an app for, um, for, for registering for animal licenses, dog licenses, cat licenses, along with lots and found. And I'll get, I'll, I'll get into details on all of these. But I'll start with uh, Tell the Town, the issue reporting and tracking app. So there's just a, just a screenshot, just disclosure, Campbell River is not a uh, member yet. Uh, I hope they will be at some point, but uh, that's just a screen mocked up for uh, demonstration purposes. Uh, tell the Town, uh, report any issue to your local government authority. Uh, and you receive updates as they work to resolve the issue. So in that mock-up on your screen there, that's what a citizen would see if they were, say, uh, using this app in, in whatever city. Uh, in this particular case, the citizen has reported two issues. They've reported a stray dog and they've reported potholes. Uh, you can see the date that it was reported and there's a little status, um, little status uh, update at the bottom there. It just says submitted. As the issue works its way through the local government, that status changes. Uh, the local government will acknowledge it as received, as in progress, um, as resolved, anything. So uh, th there's a little bit of communication back to the uh, citizen as this goes along. So you know, what do you use it for? You know, of course, potholes. You can use it for stray animals. You know, maybe you want to report missed curbside garbage pickup. Uh, traffic lights not working, street lights not work, a thing. There are a lot of different um, issue reporters that are out there already. Uh, again, quite expensive, uh, quite expensive, and uh, this is available for that uh, for that cheap monthly subscription or as part of that cheap monthly subscription. Uh, another thing I should mention about this, the, the app itself, it's database driven, and I'll get into that a little more as we go on. Um, but some issue reporters, not, I'm, I'm not knocking them, but they're simple email systems uh, where it's a, um, an email form where a citizen types in something is wrong and, and hits the submit button and it's simply an email form that goes off to um, you know, either, either a senior staff person or a staff person in charge of a service or even an elected official. Um, you know, that, that's, that's great, that's a good step, but uh, you know, it, it doesn't have the ability to track the progress of the issue, doesn't store anything. It's, it's really no different than picking up your phone in a lot of ways. So uh, this is the next level from that. Um, one other thing that we think separates this out from some of the others, I mentioned we're one of these system organizations in the province. Uh, Civic Info BC has a close relationship with another system organization called the Municipal Insurance Association of BC. Um, they are an insurance pool. Um, they, they, uh, they, they offer that kind of coverage to local governments around the province. Uh, the pooled model is not new in local government. Uh, MIABC graciously created uh, a list of recommended practices for local governments and First Nations that choose to use this app uh, because there is, a, there is a liability when you take something on like this. You have to be sure that if you are providing people with a mechanism to report these issues, uh, that you also have the resources and people in place to deal with them, to uh, actually solve the problems. So it's, um, it, it's a list of recommended practices from the MIABC just to limit one's liability when you roll it out. And that's just something, it's, it's not something we charge for. Uh, we're not actually in this to make money at all. We're in this to serve. Uh, so no additional charge for something like that. App number two, a Town Crier. 
So this is a very, very simple one. And it's just an alternate system for pushing public notices into people's hands. Uh, it's a um, it's a push notification alert system uh, for local governments and citizens to communicate directly with citizens. Um, social media is cluttered. Social media is poison. Uh, it, it has a it has a place, but uh, we we all know what the clutter is like. Um, this is just a very simple app that people can install on their phone, and when a local government has a specific notice that's uh, that may be of interest to you, and you can choose through the app what you like. You, know, you might just want the regular public notices. You might want the local government news. You might want when you got their council schedule, public safety notices, public work notices, special events, uh, something crazy. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's development. Uh, that, that's just a development screenshot there of something crazy. But you, you can actually add categories. You can do whatever you want. Whatever category you want in there is fine. Uh, so you install the app on your phone. You select what categories you wish to receive a notice for. And when there is a notice published, uh, you, your, your phone just, your phone buzzes and you, you get the app just delivered to your phone. It's very simple. And that's kind of the common theme through all of our apps, that they're meant to be simple, they're meant to be small, they're meant to be agile. So uh, very simple. So you know, what else can you use it for? Inform people about open meetings. Um, you know, we talk about this a lot in local government, the, um, the legislated minimum that exists for local governments to, for uh, publication of public notices. Uh, typically, you have to put a public notice in a local newspaper you know, for, for um, you know, X number of times, so many days before a certain deadline. And that's a minimum. And increasingly, we find that, uh, that citizens are complaining that they don't see these notices, that uh, they were unaware that certain things were happening in their neighborhood. Um, so there's a real push with local governments to exceed the legislated minimums for uh, notices. So this app is a way to uh, to assist with that. Um, it's not on the slide, but uh, another another really interesting uh, application for this. Uh, some some of you on the line may be from communities where the uh, where the weekly paper has gone under in the last little while. That's uh, that's a fairly common occurrence as well. So what, what do you do if you're a local government authority and you're in a small community where your community paper has gone belly up? Um, a tool like this doesn't replace your statutory requirement to advertise in another newspaper, but it does provide you with a practical channel for informing citizens um, in the, uh, of whatever in the absence of your community newspaper. So it can be something of a substitute when your community newspaper is gone. Uh, so you, again, you can also notify people about special events or deadlines, uh, you know, your, your property tax uh, deadline, for example, or a you know, special event. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's even something like a community festival, or maybe it's uh, or, or a parade or whatever. It, it does, doesn't have to be you know serious business all the time. Distribution of non-emergency news uh, and information about you know, things like routine road work, uh, water main flushing, things like that. It is not meant to be a replacement for a purpose-built emergency notification system. I do have to say that uh, there are some very robust systems in place out there for uh, emergency notification, you know, say in the event of a tsunami or a wildfire. Uh, no doubt some of your communities have them in use. Uh, they are very robust, very well constructed, and they are purpose-built for this reason. Uh, I, I'm subscribed to one in my home community. I live in the district of North Saanich. And uh, I, I know for a fact it works. I get text notifications and uh, my phone actually rings if there is a uh, emergency uh, pending or, or if there's a test. So uh, you know, you know, stellar to have a system like that in place. I have to stress that our app is not meant for that, it's not emergency only, but uh, it does have a purpose. The third app, uh, Tour of the Town, which is a customizable local map for tourism and other purposes. Uh, this one, this one was one of the ideas that came out of a focus group that we did with uh, the Ministry of Job Training Technology staff uh, early this year, and we sat around for a morning and just brainstormed uh, ideas. Uh, you know, great ideas came out of uh, ministry staff. Uh, you know, what what would be a simple app that maybe we could roll out that that would just that would support businesses, uh, that would support uh, you know downtowns, that would support uh, you know, economic development, quite frankly. And this was one of the uh, this was one of the easier ones that came out in the suggestion list. So it was uh, just make your own map. So you know, this is this is a mock-up of what that might look like. 
Uh, this is one that's almost finished. Uh, it's in the development cycle now. But uh, essentially, you know, take a map, drop pinpoints on it, uh, you know, label your map accordingly. Uh, you can do things like map out community festivals, uh, you know, the location of stages, booths, uh, where vendors are. Uh, that's just one use. You could create, say, another custom map for that, that charts out where your business improvement association members are. You know, you want to. You want a map for people who are visiting the town, you know, please come and, uh, and uh, you know, shop at these merchants or, or visit these businesses. These are the members of our local BIA. Uh, you know, here's the location. Here's the business profile. You know, describe it a little more, right? Uh, you know, play it up. It's a little bit of an advertising vehicle that way. Um, you know, a local government could use something like this to, if they're so inclined, to pinpoint where development applications and permit locations are in the municipality. So you could use it for a serious business like that. Uh, again, more on the uh, business development and economic development side, you could use it for like a special event like dine around town restaurants. Uh, that's a popular program in some municipalities. Art and sculpture walks, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, places like Castle Guard, uh, have a have a great one. Sydney has a great one. Historical tours, garden tours, uh, agritourism. You know, whatever you can imagine that's maybe a, that, that's a purpose-built map, something just kind of small, something uh, something that you think your visitors might be interested in, or your residents, or, or, or business members. So that's what it's there for. A quick question, Todd. Um, someone had just asked, yeah. would you be able to draw a parade route on it? You bet. Yep, that would be uh, that, 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 that. That's certainly part of the functionality that's under development. Good question. Thank you for that. Uh, moving on, the uh, fourth and uh, final one that I'm in a position to talk about today is, uh, again, the working title is My Pet Pal, uh, Animal License Renewals and Lost Pet Notification System. Uh, so you know, th th this, is, this is just uh, a, a cheap slide, purely pandering because it's, uh, it's, it's just an interesting photo. Uh, but you can renew, renewing your dog license is, uh, is, is obviously a core function that you want in an app like this. Uh, you know, dog licenses, you know, people sometimes think that they're, they're a cash grab on the part of the municipality. Uh, not the case usually. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, you know, there, there's a variety of purposes behind them. Uh, they're, they're not exactly money, uh, money, uh, money generators. They're, they're, they're not that great in that respect. More often than not, it's just to keep tabs on how many dogs are in your municipality. Uh, you know, if there's a lost dog, you, you return the dog uh, based on the license information, things like that. So what, what can we use this for? Renew the pet license from a mobile phone. Report a missing pet. We think that's we think that's huge. You'd be able to tap into uh, to, to the other app users and re uh, report a pet that uh, your if your pet's gone missing. You're going to be able to report or look up a found pet. So uh, again, connect with other pet owners in your municipality. And uh, I don't know if any of you are from the uh, from the Central Okanagan, but uh, the Central Okanagan Regional District did a uh, pet app of its own a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and this was a really popular feature. It remains a popular feature, from what I understand. Uh, news and special promotions that are of interest to local pet owners. So uh, I, I know that occasionally they might publish, say, like a, uh, a special promotion from a pet food store, you know, 20% off kibble this week, or, or whatever it is. There's a little bit of a sponsorship opportunity there, quite frankly. Uh, that's an optional feature. So really, it's renew licenses, it's report a missing pet, it's uh, report a found pet or look up a found pet, and, uh, and news and special promotions. Uh, we think this one's going to be quite popular, actually, but this is also the most complex of the four. Another question so, that you had, um, yes. you, someone yes. had asked, will you be able to turn off something like renew an annual pet license or how will that functionality yes. be? Yeah, yeah. All, of, all of that is in the hands of the user. So uh, yeah, you, you don't have to renew through the app, obviously. A local government will have a great deal of um, freedom on what they would like to do with something like this. So, you know, if, if a local government actually didn't want to use this for renewal of pet licenses, uh, you know, let's just say they still prefer the counter method for uh, pet license purchases and renewals, they can leave that feature out uh, and it could be solely a missing pet, found pet kind of a uh, app if they want. So yeah, there's some flexibility built in for sure. Does that answer the question? Are you hearing, uh, hearing no follow-up, I'll move on. So managing the apps. So 
for this kind of a thing to work. These are all standalone apps, but they're all related and they're all connected. And the key to the system is a backend database, uh, the Civic Labs web platform and database, which provides a common framework for all the apps to, to rest on, to be built on. It is Canadian hosted. We're hosted uh, off of the uh, Amazon Web Services uh, farm out of Montreal. So it meets our uh, BC data residency requirements. Our clients, the local governments or the First Nations can select their apps and adjust settings through the civiclabs.ca site. And citizens themselves need to be directed to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store when a local government has decided to deploy the app in their community. So this is that, um, this is that work I was mentioning earlier where it's up to the local government really to market the app, you know, say, hey, look, we now have the, uh, you know, tell the town issue reporter deployed, uh, download it on Google Play or the App Store, and uh, you will find us there. Uh, log in as town of whatever, and and you're set. Uh, so citizens have to download those apps in the uh, in the appropriate store. But local governments and First Nations manage the apps through the civiclabs.ca uh, website backend. So there's a screenshot of what the app library looks like. Uh, so there's the four apps right there. So if you are a member of the pool. You've logged in using your user, your unique username and password, and there it is, dead simple. All you need to do is select the apps that you wish to use. You click on them, and that's it. You, they're, they're enabled for your community. Uh, if you've got that login access where you're authorized to be in there, and you just turn it on you, with one click, you're there. It's, it's enabled, and it's ready for you to use. Um, the apps that are in there, they're available to the subscribers as is. So this is one of the ways that this model works, is uh, it's not something that we customize for every municipality. Uh, it, it, it needs to be as is. Uh, that said, if there is a strong desire to take one of those apps, like, again, let's just uh, say it's the issue reporter, tell the town. If there's a desire to take that and build it out beyond what we have in that as is form, uh, we can and will make the source code available under a license uh, to our subscribers. Uh, they can take that source code away, build on it however they wish. Uh, that would be up to the individual member. Uh, those costs incurred would be up to the individual member. Uh, but there's an opportunity there perhaps for local software developers uh, if, that is, uh, if that is something that anybody wants to do. Uh, so you can take the basic one that we've built and you can, uh, you can enhance it if you want, but that's at your cost. When you're in the admin console, you can customize your app. Again, very basic, but it should be enough. It is enough for a lot of small communities, for most small communities, we think. Uh, essentially, what you do is you change your you uh, change your color scheme to match whatever the color scheme is for your uh, for your local government. Uh, you know, everybody's got one for their website, for their uh, for their logo. Local governments have uh, have color schemes, so uh, you select yours and you upload your local government logo. And uh, you, you may recall earlier that demonstration screen that had Campbell River on it. You, know, you saw that there was a logo uploaded. You saw that there were colors there. Uh, this is where you select those. You manage your individual apps through this console. So this is a, uh, this is a screenshot of uh, just, a, just a test record through the Tell the Town app. Uh, this, is, this is a noise complaint. One of my, one of my staff, he's a, uh, he's a new dad. That's his, that's his little guy, and he uh, decided he was going to file a noise complaint. Um, so this is what you would get on the back end uh, if you are the local government staff person who's receiving, in this case, the, uh, the Tell the Town submission. So you can see, you know, in this case, the person's uploaded a photo. There's a description of the issue. Uh, you can see if you squint that uh, on the administration side of things, there's a, a space where you uh, report where the issue, to whom the issue has been assigned. Um, a, a cat, you categorize the issue, you know, public works, um, you know, administration, parks and recreation, whatever. Um, the location information is there. Uh, notice that it's got a street address. Uh, that may have been inputted directly in this case, but it, you, you see it's also got latitude and longitude. I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the features of that particular app is when you're reporting an issue, you just tap on a, you tap on the screen, you tap on a map, and, and drop a pin, uh, and, and that actually gives uh, the local government or First Nation a uh, an exact uh, pinpoint within a few feet of where this issue is. Uh, information about the submitter and away you go. 
So, you know, th this is a simple management console behind the scenes that a local government or a First Nation could use. And all of the apps have them. Uh, this is just the one for the, uh, for the Tell the Town app. The Town Crier's got one, My Pet Pal's got one, Tour of the Town, the, uh, the little mapping app has them. They're all there. So it's a complete system for you. And earlier, members have a say in what we do. So when they're logged into the behind the scenes Civic Labs platform, there's a place where you can make suggestions for new apps or suggestions uh, on how we can improve existing ones. Uh, and there's actually a, a little bit of a crowdsourcing voting mechanism built into this where members of the pool vote for the next app to be developed. So in order for this to be a self-sustaining, self-funding program, um, the development cycle, it's not fixed. You know, it's not like every three months we're going to develop an app or every six months we're going to develop an app. It is, it, it is tied to what we're bringing in in terms of subscription fees. Uh, so the voting period can be adjusted, uh, lengthened or shortened accordingly. But uh, when subscription fees have accumulated to an efficient uh, to a sufficient level that we can cover the cost of developing a new app, both iOS and Android, uh, that's when we would close off voting for the next app. So uh, you know it, it, it's it's rather democratic in that way. That's uh, that's a neat part of the system, I think. Uh, when you are voting, the top three projects appear at the top and others below. And like I said, the voting period is variable depending on available funds. So uh, I'm rounding the bend here uh, near the end. Pricing and how to order. Uh, we think this is ridiculously affordable for small local governments. Uh, we hope that it's something uh, that, that, that they uh, have to see value in. So our pricing. Uh, we have it set at $75 per month for communities with fewer than 2,500 residents. Uh, again, we want this to be about the price of a, uh, of a corporate cell phone bill. Uh, we have it up to $100 a month for communities of 2,501 to 10,000 people, 125 for communities of 10,000 to 25,000. We did the larger communities over 50,000. We, still, we still want them, 150 a month for 25,000 to 75,000. When you get into that handful of communities that are over 75,000, you know, we know that that's custom quote kind of country, and uh, that's probably custom need kind of country. Uh, it might be that in those uh, circumstances, if there are communities that wish to use these apps or be members of the pool, uh, where it might make sense to just make the existing apps available under license and uh, let those communities build them out how they see fit. But uh, again, affordability is the key. It's, um, you know, the development cost for apps is usually crippling. Uh, this shouldn't cripple anybody. This should be, any budget, the budget should be just fine. Uh, this should be affordable for just about any community out there. And the prices aren't meant to change. So this is our basic, you know, basic, basic business model, how it works over time. Uh, so we have, Bottom arrow, the light green arrow, support and maintenance. Uh, you know, we think that the amount of money that we're going to be, well, we know the amount of money that we're going to be spending on support and maintenance for these apps over time, it's going to go up. That's fine. The black arrow, development, the number of apps that we are developing over time, it's going to go down. There is a finite cap to the number of apps that are absolutely uh, useful. Uh, there are, there, there, there comes a point where we would, we, we don't want to be developing apps for the sake of apps. Uh, we have a list of apps that we think are uh, likely to be developed in the coming years, but if we had to guess, it probably caps out around a couple of dozen. Uh, who knows? We could be surprised because there's that democratic mechanism and people can suggest things. Uh, you know, maybe new ideas will keep coming along for a while yet, but we do think the development cycle is going to be a little more hectic in these first few years and it will gradually subside. Um, and and you know, over time, number of subscribers, you know, we're experiencing uh, what well, we think that the curve that you see there is what we will experience over time. Um, you know, that initial kind of a uh, take up and it'll flatline over time. We hope it goes up over time, uh, but it, you know, it, it will certainly level up. That's just a normal business curve. But that is how we think we can keep the pricing relatively stable over the years. Uh, it, it amounts to more money being allocated for support and maintenance and updates less money over time being allocated for development, but it's a fluid environment and it just changes over time. That is it. I'm about five minutes ahead of where I thought I might be. I was probably talking a little fast. My apologies if I was. 
Uh, but I did want to leave about 15 minutes at the end for open dialogue, for questions and answers, uh, and just to uh, discuss anything that you might want to. So, uh, you know, thanks very much for uh, for listening for these past 40 minutes, and uh, I'd love to open the floor up to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Todd. We have had a number of questions come in um, in the last section that you've been speaking about, so I'll just uh, try and run through those. If there's any that we aren't able to okay. get to in this 15 minutes, um, I'll be sure to connect you with the people that have asked those questions so that you can follow up with them directly after the session. Um, the first question great. is, um, have you successfully integrated these apps with common municipal software systems that are doing similar tracking? They're meant to be independent of common municipal software systems. Um, for us to do that, uh, extremely time consuming, extremely expensive, and uh, different vendors would be more open to that than others. So it's not impossible. Again, that might be one of those situations where it makes sense to uh, take the app as is under license. And if you want to integrate it with the uh, software system that you have in place, that's fine. Um, it's worth it's worth noting too that you can deploy any or all some of the apps. Uh, you know, some of them some of them just frankly aren't going to be meant to integrate with a software system or couldn't. So yeah, it's 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 going to be probably under license uh, to you if you want to pay for that development cost. Uh, but no, we're not taking that on ourselves. Okay, great. Um, and then another question came in. Um when these are going to be published for people to download in app stores, are they being published all as one or specifically by municipality, from municipality to municipality? Really good question. Really good question. We wrestled with that uh, exact question for a while. Um, it is all as one. Um, there are reasons for that. Um, specifically, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the policies in the app store, um, the Apple environment in particular, they don't like app cloning. So they don't like you um, rebranding the same app again and again and again and again. Uh, in fact, it's uh, not allowed. So what we have done instead is that one app in the App Store, and uh, when a citizen initially logs in, they select their municipality uh, or First Nation, and the app remembers that. So once you've downloaded it and selected your municipality on that first login, uh, you're, you're, you're there, you're, you're set up. But uh, no, I wish we could brand the app, you, you, know, you know, town of whatever, but uh, we are facing restrictions in the app stores that don't permit us to do that. Great, thanks for that. Um, someone was in, interested if you have a demo subscriber login account for people to log into to have a, a better look or another look at the, the applications that have been developed. Absolutely, uh, my uh, contact information is on the screen still. If anybody would like to arrange the uh, demonstration, we are happy to do that. We do have that. So just contact me, send me an email, call me. Uh, we'll arrange for that kind of a uh, demonstration with that demo login and uh, go from there. Um, and then can data be exported for the integration with other tools like Power BI? Oh, good question. There, we have not built that functionality into the back end. There is no reason that we couldn't. Um, a data export's very simple, so um, that's you know that, that, that's one for the suggestion column. Quite frankly, uh, strikes me as an easy one. Uh, I think we could do it. I, I know we could do it. Uh, it's not there now, but yeah, if, if that's uh, something you'd like to do, let's talk. Great. And um, for the for the Tell the Town app specifically, do you is there a way for uh, municipalities to deal with duplicate issue requests if they get overlaid? How, how do they manage if there's multiple um, people reporting the same issues? Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Um, multiple people will report the same issue regardless. Um, whether, you, whether you've got that Tell the Town app or not, you're going to get multiple phone calls, you're going to get multiple emails. So no, there isn't a way that we can prevent people from reporting duplicate issues. Uh, what it does give you is a way to um, perhaps deal with them quickly. Uh, if you've got a bunch coming in by the app, you can uh, set the uh, set the response uh, as soon as it's there. The, the user gets that submitted uh, message. Uh, if you've got somebody on the back end that just you know, is clicking, you know, the, the status to in progress or we're working on it, something like that. Uh, at least you're getting back to those people really quickly, rapid fire. You could use that perhaps in conjunction with the uh, with the Town Crier app, and uh, presumably some of the same people who are interested in municipal business um, to the point that they've downloaded one would have the other. 
uh, and you could uh, you could push out a notice. You know, we are dealing with the fallen tree at Third Street in Maine, uh, or, or or we're aware of the a giant car eating pothole on uh, on Second Street. You know, so there are different ways that you would communicate it, but no, we can't we can't block duplicates. Great. And a couple of people are asking, how many municipalities are currently subscribed or are currently interested, or are you working with um, in terms of the um, getting into Civic Labs yep. using the apps? It's it's early days. Uh, we are in discussions with probably about a half a dozen right now. And um, you know it, it's it's early. We've only had two uh, available for the last little while, with two more coming down the pipe. So the timing of this webinar is actually really great because we would love to work with more. We want to get this uh, we want to get this moving, uh, and we need uh, we need municipal partners to work with us. So municipal budget cycles. Uh, some of you are from local government. Some of you are from First Nations. Some of you are from economic development offices. Uh, you guys know the budget cycles. Uh, it, it takes a year for things to wind through, even if it's a small item like a you know, $100 a month subscription. So we're just kind of at that point now where when we were pushing this um, you know, midpoint last year, uh, yes, okay, we got to wait till the 2020 budget is uh, in effect and uh, we can go from there. So that's where we're at now. Okay. Just in terms of you, um, use, um, does each member municipality get multiple users to be able to log in, or is there one shared login per subscription? How does that work? You can have multiple users. Okay. So a municipality could have multiple login information yes. based on the different staff that are using it. Correct. Um, and what a uh, couple of uh, uh, questions that are specific about um, the different apps. What's the base mapping that's used for Tour the Town? <laughs> At the moment, we're using OpenStreetMap, uh, but we'll see. Uh, that one's still in the shop, and uh, I'm expecting an update on Friday, to be frank. Okay. And what is the plan for payment details related to dog licensing? That is going to be a, an interesting question. Um, we will have the ability in this app to collect payment on behalf of a small local government if that's something they want us to do. Um, we may be able to pipe that right through to the local government payment system depending on what it is. Again, this one's meant for small communities that might not have sophisticated uh, payment systems in place, at least in an online environment. So we will be offering a basic one that a small local government could use. Um, that, that that that's under our um, under our uh, umbrella. Um, but yeah, in terms of integrating it with your systems, every local government is going to be a little different, and we're going to have to you know just see what we can pipe into. We can do a lot with APIs. Uh, we do have the ability to uh, connect to some different systems uh, that way. So yeah. That one, again, it's the most complex of them. It's the least, it's still very much under development and it's the least developed of all of them at the moment. And uh, I wish I could give you a better answer and a more straightforward answer than that. I'll be able to give you a better straightforward answer in maybe about three weeks time. Um, I don't have it now though. Um, a question, I, and I don't know if you guys are at this stage yet, but of the member municipalities, um, have any of the apps been implemented? And if so, how many residents are using those apps? Like what percentage of residents so, have the apps? Yeah, we're, 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 we're not at that stage yet. And uh, even, even, you know, flash forward like a year from now, I don't think it would be possible to really tell for sure what percentage would be using the app. Uh, it, it would be... Your measures would be more in terms of uh, just how, how citizens are engaging, you know, and, um, the level to which they engage with you through the app year to year, whether that increases, decreases, or whatever. Um, we could see the total number of downloads, obviously. We could uh, see how many have logged in, but you know, the percentage, whether they're actually using it, hmm. you know, that, that, that's, um, that, that, that's more science fiction than it is science, I'm afraid. So in terms of metrics that will indicate uptake and usage by residents, it's going to be mainly downloads and um, what was the other thing that you had said for metrics? I, I would suggest it's uh, interactions through the app itself. Mm -hmm. um, again, on the Tell the Town app, how many submissions did you get in a, in a year uh, through the app? That's a very simple measure. Uh, what was the percent change year over year? Another very simple measure. Those are, those are the kind of metrics you'd want to track internally. Again, we're trying to price this so low that um, 
you know, even if uptake is low to begin with, you haven't lost anything. That's the idea. Um, and then, um, in terms of uh, the municipalities or First Nations organizations that come on board, um, would you, how do you have market, would Civic Labs have marketing materials to help support the implementation of the app in the community to get the word out and get, get subscribers? We have some very basic messaging. Uh, again, it'll be up to the local government because every local government's different and we don't have the resources to support, um, you know, dozens and dozens of local governments, uh, nor do we have the budget to do that. So we do rely on local governments themselves to say put notices in their community newsletters that exist now. Uh, you know, do an insert in your utility notice. Um, you know, rely on on local media. Uh, you know, th th there are still local papers out there that'll report this kind of thing. We can help. We can provide advice. We have some key messages. We do have material like that, but we don't say have uh, you know 10,000 glossy brochures that we can ship to you and have those sent to every resident. Um, we don't have those kind of pockets, unfortunately. Great, and then just one more question that had come in just in terms of um, the different systems and how they're gonna to work together. Would it be easy to tie an app into or into existing an existing GIS system um, so that you could leverage the maps we already have to be to, to in the Tour the Town app? Mm -hmm. uh, that would be up to the local government. So again, we would make that particular app available to the local government under license and uh, that would be up to the local government to uh, work with the developer of its choice to do that. Um, another question that's come in around uh, t the Tell the Town app, uh, is there an option for um, app users to be able to see all of the um, outstanding issues, not just the ones that they have created them and put in themselves? At the present time, no. Um, possible we could do it um, we have there's, there's privacy considerations there that we have to make sure um, people's personal privacy uh, is protected to an adequate degree that they are not that, that someone would not be able to view any kind of an issue that's been logged that might personally identify somebody who has uh, chosen to report the issue so that would be uh, that would be an enhancement for the future whether it's possible or not uh, we would really have to think through the privacy implications of that uh, before we do anything absolutely now that makes sense. Um, so I think we've gotten through all of the questions that have come in um, during the session. I'll just give a couple more minutes in case people um, are thinking of anything last minute. Um, and then obviously on on your screen, you can see um, Todd's contact information and he's been very generous to let everyone know that they can reach out if they have any other questions or want to know more about uh, the project after today's session. Okay. So I'm just going to take control back over. So I just want to remind everyone that uh, logged in today that this session was recorded. So if you do have um, uh, want to see this information again or want to share uh, the information that Todd provided with someone else in your uh, organization that might be interested in uh, you know, implementing these apps. It will be posted in about a week on our website, gov.bc.ca backslash economic development under the BC Ideas Exchange webinar section. So um, we'll try to get that up there within a week and then we'll also have those handout slides if you were able to download them during the session today. And I just wanted to let everyone know if, you, uh, if you're new to the webinar and you just popped in because of this one, you can uh, sign up for our distribution list so you'll be notified of all of our upcoming webinars. Um, we don't have anything uh, scheduled, but we're working on a number of um, topics that are going to be uh, coming to you in April and May. We're going to be chatting with the Small Business Venture Capital Tax Credit Program. They're going to be just going through um, how you can get involved in that program, um, how uh, the, the eligible, eligibility requirements, and they'll be there to answer any questions that you might have if you're trying to um, support people getting into that program. We're going to also be following up on a cannabis webinar that we had last year. Um, it was very popular and had a lot of uh, people wanting to know more about people that are being successful in the cannabis industry. Um, so we'll be sharing some success stories 
for um, with that and have an opportunity again for people to ask questions for those people that have entered the inter industry successfully on um, ways that they may be able to do that themselves. And then in May, we are going to be um, uh, having a session on the Great BC Business Sale. Um, so people will be able to um, learn about how their community can get ready for the BC Great Business, BC Business Sale um, and uh, what, what, uh, what that might entail and what businesses and organizations need to know. And with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us today. If you have any questions or suggestions for a future webinar topic, um, please do send us an email at economicdevelopment@gov.bc.ca. And I'd really like to thank Todd and um, for, for lending his time both to share what's going on with the, the apps and answer all those questions that everyone was able to submit. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here and the opportunity to share this. It was great. Absolutely. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll end the webinar. And if people have any further questions for myself or for Todd, you should have our contact information now and the webinar will be posted later next week. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.